Uh, hello, everyone. We got a great crowd today. This is fantastic. Uh, I'm Sarah Grimm from the Wisconsin Historical Society, and I want to welcome you all to the start of our Practical Digital Preservation webinar series that's beginning today and continuing through early summer next year. These offerings are a continuation of the Costa Preservica Partnership webinars that we started last year. So on to round two. This year's program is going to be a little bit different in that it will focus. Uh, Becky, can you pop my slide? I know I have a ball, but it's not working for me. No, nope, got it. Uh, this year's program is going to be a little bit different in that it will focus on both archive staff with our hot topic webinars like last year and our state agency partners with the other webinars and briefings. For the practical digital preservation briefings, we are going to be reaching out to senior management and IT decision makers. And for the online workshops, we're going to be offering digital preservation training to agency record officers or similarly interested parties. Uh, more complete descriptions of these are available on the PERTS portal at the path at the bottom of the page here. And you are, of course, welcome to sign up for any of these, just like the hot topics. Um, if you feel you're going to benefit or forward them on to people in your agency or to state agencies, anyone who you feel is going to benefit from these. Our hot topic webinars are more internally focused on key preservation issues for the archive staff and those are listed here in the middle of the slide. Those start today along with an immediate change which you're going to see in that bright red right there. Um, we are canceling January's program on, collecting, on connecting digital preservation with catalog systems due to speaker conflicts. So I just want to make note of that here. But the good news is that we're going to be adding another presentation later in the series and we will keep you posted on that and let you know when another one will take place at one of our future webinars or on the website um, where the rest of these are posted. Uh, today's program on digital preservation storage choices is going to cover a variety of options for those of us looking to manage and preserve our digital content. And we have a great panel of speakers for today's session and I'm going to take a minute to introduce them. David Portman from Preservica is going to kick us off today. David joined the Preservica team at the start of 2016 to promote awareness and education of digital preservation and he previously worked helping global organizations transform the management of IT assets, services, expenses, and usage. And he worked with us on last year's webinars, so glad to have you back. Our, uh, second, back. our second speaker is Veronica Martzel, who is the Digital Records Archivist for the Massachusetts Archives, where she is responsible for the implementation of a new archival collections management system and digital preservation repository as well as the arrangement and description of all digital content held by the archives. She will be joined by Jim Corridan, the Director and State Archivist from the Indiana Archives and Records Administration. And in his position, Jim has established Indiana's electronic records program with the archives. He serves as a sponsor of Indiana's National Digital Newspaper Project and has coordinated statewide efforts to provide workshops on digital preservation and electronic records. And our final speaker is Elizabeth Perks, who is the Electronic Records Archivist at the Utah State Archives. Elizabeth has been instrumental in the development of the Utah State Archives on-site digital repository and has participated in several interstate collaborations, which have greatly improved our collective wisdom on issues surrounding the management and preservation of electronic records. So if while we're going through this presentation you have any questions, please feel free to enter any of them on the chat box on the right-hand side and we promise to leave time at the end of the webinar to get your questions answered. Also at the end there will be a survey when you close your browser and if you could take a couple minutes to fill that out, that would be fantastic. And as a final note, this webinar will be recorded and posted on the PERTS portal in the future if you want to listen again. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to David. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. And a very warm welcome to all of you. So it is a great pleasure to be working once again with COSA. Uh, we're extremely excited to get this 2016-2017 Practical Digital Preservation Program underway. So as Sarah has mentioned, we've got some fantastic sessions coming up over the next six to seven months. Um, and that all starts here today with, with our webinar on digital preservation storage choices. Got some great speakers for you. Sarah's just done a fabulous job of introducing them and some really good content for you today. So I'm going to just start off by talking a little bit about where storage fits into digital preservation requirements and then run you through a cloud storage checklist. I'm then going to pass over to Veronica, who's going to look at speaking the language of IT. 
Then we're going to go over to Jim, and Jim's going to look at selecting and negotiating storage solutions. We're then going to move on to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is going to cover storage and IT analysis. And then at the end of today's session, a quick summary, and as Sarah said, there's an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so questions on anything you've seen and heard from today's speakers. Okay, just get the, sl the slide moving forward there. Um, so just as a way then of, of really trying to set the scene, I think many of you are going to be familiar with the OAIS model for preserving digital content. That's the ISO standard for 14721. You can see it there. It's got six components, uh, one of which is archival storage. And other components also include um, things like how you're going to ingest content, how you're going to provide access, um, how you will organize and manage your data. Um, there's also a consideration for how you're going to administrate the system. And of course, the key to this is preservation planning and actions to ensure that your content lives on into the future. So another way of looking at this is using the items on the right hand side there. So you want to add safe and durable storage. So that's looking at multiple copies in multiple locations and self-healing. You also need to look at a way to add metadata and provide structure so that your content can be searched and is findable uh, in the future. And of course, I touched on this just now, but that key active preservation to ensure you can actually read and use the information um, and actually that that information is trusted long into the future. Okay, so another way of looking at this maybe is to look at it vertically. Uh, so you see on the left hand side of, of the uh, slide there, got down at the bottom safe and intelligent storage, organized information and usable formats. So this is where there's a real opportunity to add value with digital preservation uh, to your state. Um, and this is actually with digital preservation software and uh, not just the storage. Although, of course, storage is very important and you obviously need to kind of look after those bits and the bytes. Um, but you can actually do a whole lot more if you have a good digital preservation sitting on top of that storage choice. And by doing so, you, you can allow yourself to become more productive and allow you to have more time to, to get on with your day-to-day -day tasks in your role. So storage is actually becoming a, more, a commodity, uh, cloud storage especially. Uh, is really coming down in price. And you can see there quite small text, but there's a, a little quote um, that's basically saying the big vendors such as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Google, and IBM are all locked in this price war. So they're all battling against each other, and, and the price of cloud storage is really starting to uh, come down. So what you need to do then, you need to choose a system that actually gives you flexibility. Uh, it's intelligent and provides you with choice. And this really then allows you to actually optimize your costs uh, by using the best price and actually the most suitable storage solution for the content that you have. And actually having that flexibility um, is important. It's giving you the ability to uh, arrange and rearrange your content. And that allows you to kind of stay relevant and also meet any organizational changes uh, that may come up in the future. Um, and that, it, it's, it's, you know, going back to the, the active uh, preservation piece that I touched on on the last slide, really is essential to have active and an automated way uh, to migrate those file formats. Okay, so digital preservation is, is not just about unlocking your information. Uh, it's not sorry. It's not just about locking information away and storing it. Um, if you really want to kind of unlock that value of, of your of your content, your assets, then access um, and transparency to those materials is essential. And you can almost see it as kind of a partner. So access is a partner going hand in hand with active preservation. So I just thought I'd share a couple of examples with you 
Um, you can see those on, on the kind of bottom right hand side there. Um, so a couple of examples of states, a um, couple of states that are using uh, an access portal. Um, so one example there is Texas State Library and Arcos Commission. So they're actually using AWS, that's Amazon Web Services GovCloud, uh, to meet uh, the challenges uh, represented by not only the different types of records, uh, but also to meet the, stat, the, the Texas state mandate to actually ensure that their records are not only preserved, um, but are also accessible to the public. So that's the state mandate that they're meeting. And they're doing that through their Texas Digital Archive, which was uh, released, um, I believe, uh, in 2015. Another example um, in the kind of bottom right there is uh, the trustees of a reservation and they're based out in Massachusetts and they've actually created an access site um, to share their content and are now actually able to reach new audiences um, by sharing that content online. And finally, just in the kind of bottom left hand device there, you've got South Carolina State Archive um, who are using digital preservation to, to actually protect um, and make their collection again accessible to their public. So moving down then on to connectivity. So if you want to remain productive and you don't want to kind of get brought down by manually ingesting re-key metadata, you really need that catalog synchronization uh, with systems such as um, Calm, AdLib, um, and also Archive Space. You also need to make sure that you've got a way of ingesting content in bulk. Um, that might be from, from email, uh, from an ECM solution or from uh, following a digitization process. Um, and as I was saying previously, just at the bottom there, uh, you actually need to make sure that you stay flexible. Uh, that enables you to actually stay relevant as well. Okay, so just uh, a very kind of basic diagram looking at storage deployment examples here. Um, so if you look towards the bottom left of this slide, um, we've got an example here of a fully cloud-hosted option, uh, which would be a, probably appropriate or most appropriate for organizations with limited on-site IT resources. Um, and it's really for organizations who are looking for the system to work without any intervention of local servers. Alternatively, of course, if you do have that IT resource, uh, you can choose an on-premise storage solution. Um, but there are considerations um, in terms of responsibility for security, um, hardware operations, and overall cost of actually deploying and, and running and maintaining that on-premise storage. Now, you can actually see in the top, kind of towards the top right there, um, it's actually grown in popularity. But this third option is, is what we're looking at here is, is hybrid storage. So what you're doing there is you're combining cloud and local storage. So with a hybrid system, for example, you'd be keeping two copies on local storage and then one copy in the cloud. OK, so I've just pulled together this uh, a quick checklist of consideration, consider, start again, considerations for cloud storage. So most major cloud vendors, the likes of AWS, Microsoft, Google, do offer affordable and durable storage options. And they include integrity, integrity check-in and self-healing. Um, and there's plenty of choices out there for cloud storage. As we said earlier, is rapidly becoming uh, commoditized, and there is that real price war uh, going on from all of those major cloud vendors. So intelligent storage choices, um, you need to make sure that you can set up your system and you can make automated intelligent choices about where your content goes. Um, so for example, if you're looking at frequently accessed content, you might want to select Amazon Web Services S3. So this is a low latency storage. It's fast. You can get your content out quickly. Um, and for larger files, uh, but maybe not as frequently accessed, you may then decide to actually use Amazon's Glacier storage. And you've also got similar choices that work in the same way available from the likes of Microsoft and the other big vendors. So these in intelligent storage choices uh, then allow you to actually optimize uh, your costs as well. So security, 
um, it is very important. It's a very important point. Um, most major cloud vendors have the ISO 2001 certification, um, and your software provider um, ha should have this certification as well. Now, there's a lot of investment in security and infrastructure going on from the, the big players in cloud at the moment. Um, and you, you might want to also consider that actually cloud could be more secure um, than your local setup, on-premise setup. Um, just still keeping with security, user access control. Um, so who can see what, um, what they can actually do with that content uh, right down to the record level. Um, so this kind of access uh, should be controlled and uh, available as an option through your preservation software, uh, which would sit on top of your of your storage. Okay, so looking at compliance now, um, it's a question that often comes up. Um, you know, does it comply with HIPAA or IT compliance policies? Um, and we are again, you know, seeing a lot of investment uh, from the cloud vendors in this area of compliance. So I thought I'd just hopefully you can read it there. I thought I'd just share this um, screen grab from the Amazon AWS website, um, uh, along with this list of kind of dif uh, different compliance uh, certifications and qualifications. There's a whole host of white papers and guides um, that are available on the Amazon website uh, to help you kind of step through and uh, show you the, the vendors have actually invested heavily in, in kind of demonstrating this compliance. So you can check that out. At, uh, the URL you can see there at the top of your screen. I'm just going to go back to uh, the checklist. So final couple of points here. Um, exit strategy. Uh, you've got to think about making sure you can exit before you enter. So you know, you've got to look at look at that um, contract and agreement and make sure that there's no cost to exit and and take your content out. And finally, there ingesting large files and collections. Um, you need to make sure you've got the option to do this. So um, make sure your system uh, for digital preservation can actually ingest large files at any one time. You know, one or two megabytes is, is not very helpful. Um, you also need to consider that some cloud vendors actually provide bulk upload facilities. Um, so just one example I can give you, AWS provide a snowball appliance, which some of you may may, may have heard of, um, and that actually allows you to upload 80 terabytes at any one time. Um, and it makes sure you get your, your content safely and securely into the cloud. So that is about it from me. So I'm going to hand over to Veronica to cover speaking the language of IT. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, let's go ahead and dive right in. Much in the same way that the archives profession has its jargon and acronyms, information technology has its own abbreviations and vocabulary. I've certainly found that getting a handle on a few basic terms and concepts has helped facilitate my conversations with IT. Obviously, we don't have time here today to go very deeply into these topics or even everything covered on this hodgepodge of a slide. But hopefully this introduction will provide you with some context for your next conversation in your shop about your storage and give you a place to grow from. Okay. One of the first things I needed to correct in my own mind when I started thinking about servers and storage was the thought that I had that the term server was synonymous with storage. And some servers are configured primarily to store files. However, just as your desktop computer can be configured to run various applications, servers can also be specialized to support specific tasks or a combination of applications and storage. So when you are approaching IT about a new software product, take into account that you will need server storage space, you, or you will need server space for storage but you will also need to account for server space for a database or the application itself. And most likely, those aren't going to be on the same machine. Really, ideally, those wouldn't be on the same machine. 
When we start talking about storage, there's a few terms that are likely to be bandied about. The most basic is direct attached storage, or DAS. This is attached directly to a computer or application server, and it's not part of any sort of network. It can be as simple as the hard drive in your desktop computer or an external drive plugged in, and the information stored on it cannot be accessed without a direct connection. Network attached storage is storage that is dedicated to file sharing, and you often see it where you're working with a lot of unstructured data. As the name suggests, it is attached to a network and can be accessed anywhere from that network. Storage Area Network, or SAN, is, high speed network, is a high-speed network of storage devices connected with services where the storage is seen more as blocks rather than in, as working with files specifically. Tape drives or libraries provide an additional component of storage that can be paired with other storage options, generally to provide an offline copy of the data. And there's that word offline. Most of us have probably encountered online or, and offline in terms of storage, and they're pretty clear from their names. But you may not have encountered the idea of nearline storage. This gets to the idea, really, of tiered storage, that data doesn't need to be, that may not need to be accessed as frequently or as quickly, can be moved down to a secondary system of storage that may be running on slower disk. It's not completely off the system, but it's not running on your fastest, most powerful servers. When talking to IT, talking about backups can be a difficult discussion. And I encountered this just last week as I was discussing how many copies of digital objects I wanted to keep. For some quick context, we, are cur we currently have a locally administered NAS system which is backed up, and we also have an additional copy of our data that is housed in Amazon 3S storage in Oregon. So, and that copy is also backed up. So we've got you know, multiple copies and we've got geographic distribution of our materials, and we've got, in fact, four copies with those two backups being in place. We have some new IT personnel who are assessing our systems, and the person I was speaking with was telling me about how great this new backup system we are considering is going to be, and how it will be structured, and was, he was sort of questioning whether we really need that extra copy in the Amazon 3 storage, um, since we'll have this backup system in place. It all sounded really good, and it took me a while to get back to a place in my head where I realized, no, that I was really asking for two primary copies of the data, each of which would be backed up um, for our preservation system. This really got me thinking about what I'm planning for my storage needs. I have to take into account not only the space for my original data, but actually for two copies of the data, ideally one of them geographically distributed, as well as the backups for both. And finally, in terms of vocabulary, chances are you are encountering a lot of talk of virtualize this and virtualize that, including virtualized storage. Basically, when they're talking about virtualized storage, they are pulling together storage space from multiple devices so they act and are managed as a single device. In summary, this slide shows some of the general benefits that can come from getting outside your comfort zone to learn more about storage and the terminology of IT. It can be a slow and painful process, but I like to think of it a little bit like going to a foreign country and trying to speak the local language. You may not be fluent, but at least you'll get some respect for trying. And with that, I will go ahead and pass this over to Jim. Thank you, Veronica. Um, so uh, here we go. So Indiana has gone through a process where we've tried to identify, specifically speaking about cloud storage, um, how best to do this and what considerations should we go through. And this has taken us probably a year to get to this point um, using our current electronic records archivist, Janine Rowe, and our previous electronic records archivist, um, Thibaut Huzaman. Um, so 
these are some of the things that we had to go through to figure out what is it that we're trying to accomplish. The first thing was how much storage are we actually using or needing? Um, and you'd think that'd be really easy, but part of the calculation needs to be what are the trends, how much is incoming, and then I'll get in a second into what types of documentation or storage is this? Is it surrogate records that may have one set of requirements, confidential records which may have a different set of requirements, um, and then you have the issues of access, et cetera. Um, how much storage did we anticipate in various time frames? So when, is, when are things coming in? What's your growth rate? And that DI there was because I'm practicing my Italian in the middle of that uh, bullet point. Uh, actually, I just did a typo. And then, as I mentioned, are the records surrogates or originals? Um, we've made a decision to store all of our surrogate records in the cloud. Um, Indiana's looking at buying about a petabyte worth of storage in the cloud through, through Oracle, uh, which we have found through extensive review was the cheapest and still is the cheapest um, for certain circumstances. And it's about, I think it's a tenth of a penny per gigabyte. Uh, and then there are certain things that we're going to store with Oracle, but in a different format so it's more secure and less costly to download that stuff. Because as uh, was mentioned earlier, it's a little bit more expensive a lot more expensive, to download material from the cloud um, if you're storing it in like a dark cloud, which is where we are. And then are these records confidential or public? Um, are the right precautions existing with the vendor? And so all of that is part of the factors that we're utilizing to make our decisions. Here again, considerations open versus confidential. Obviously, if it's open, you don't have to have as many security precautions around that when you're storing. You may not need to store it in a quote-unquote government cloud. Um, the uniqueness of the content, dealing with whether or not it's a surrogate, born digital, or access copies. Uh, and then the, the other key issue is how often are you calling on that information or having to download that information back to your local whatever, your local server or, or an access point for the public. Um, most of the vendors charge for each time you draw something down. And so as you're pulling it down, you're going to have fees. So you want to make sure that you set up a system or a contract that allows you to make that um, as least expensive as possible. And you've selected the right cloud storage option so that you're not having to pay that high fee for things that aren't ever requested. The other component here is their connectivity rates. And we touched on this briefly earlier. Uh, if you need instant, fast connectivity, you're going to pay a lot of money for that. The disconnected, as Veronica mentioned, um, offline, can be much less expensive and much more secure, but it will take time to recover those files. And then lastly, security. So this is what we found <clears throat> when we went through our process. Um, you'll see Amazon Glacier. This is all more or less a dark cloud or um, storage that doesn't require, you can just sit it up there and it's not actively being used. And so Amazon Glacier is about four-tenths of a penny per gigabyte. Google Nearline is a tenth or is a penny, excuse me, per gigabyte. And the Archive Oracle Cloud is a hundredth of a penny, I'm sorry, a tenth of a penny per gigabyte. Indiana has decided that Oracle Cloud is probably the best option for us. We are negotiating, and by the way, so a petabyte comes out to about $12,000 per year with other extra fees in there. And so for $12,000, the state of Indiana can basically take almost half of its active storage and move it into the cloud, uh, which is a tremendous savings. That's the state's active storage, just not the archives. Um, and then if we needed to download that full petabyte, the cost would be $5,000 to get it back. So it's not free, uh, but it's probably fairly insignificant, and the odds of having to download the entire holdings in a single month would be probably not ever going to happen unless we were pulling everything out of um, Oracle. One of the things that we're also looking at is negotiating a stronger deal, um, making this an enterprise-wide, all of the state of Indiana has access to the cloud, um, agreement, and so we've been working with our partners in the Office of Technology, uh, which is our centralized IT office here in Indiana, and 
the archives, the state archives, is working with local governments to leverage this through our software system, which is Axiom, and seeing if there's ways for us to have all of this funneled through a single repository and portal so that there's a way for the public to access information that they want to find. Um, best thing for all of you to do if you're having to ne negotiate this is to work with your Office of Technology because they're going to have technical expertise um, and they will have their own needs and demands on this kind of storage solution. Uh, although I think honestly we are probably going to be the biggest users as far, I know we are in Indiana, um, as far as data needs. So <clears throat> let's that's probably the highlights, although I should mention with the little logo there, this last weekend was the 200th birthday of Indiana, so happy bicentennial. We've been singing happy birthday for the last year here in Indiana. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah, I believe. Or so we're going oh, to go Elizabeth. on. Elizabeth, oh, Elizabeth yeah. I'm sorry. Let me flip one more slide. There you go. Elizabeth? Yes. Um, so can everybody see my slides now? Yes, no? Yep, yep we're good. We Thank them. you. Okay. So my presentation is going along a little bit different track. We have had um, some storage issues throughout the years, and we had a, a mandate to be able to store records and we couldn't afford it. I'm sure nobody else has ever had similar problems. And this went on for many, many years and still is an issue, I think, to some degree. Um, and we had to dance around other political issues such as our IT department being centralized and having a certain philosophy that they wanted the rest of state government to toe the line with, such as having all the servers and data um, in one spot and everybody else just kind of uses that and they didn't really want us to go to outside sources to store our data and they tried to convince us that they could match prices and all those kinds of things. Um, meanwhile, archives of course had a disproportionate need for storage versus the size of our office and so we weren't funded to be able to pay for the rates that the state DTS um, was offering, we would have many conversations with people. We begged them to reduce the rate as much as we could. We tried to explain all of archives needs to various people, all the tech support people that came into our office, we would try to explain this to them and they would nod their heads and say, yeah, 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 we understand what you're saying. Um, and then they would go back to their office, even people who had authority, who were higher up managers who you think would um, try to explain it to others, it never went anywhere and we couldn't understand why it never uh, went anywhere, why it didn't help us, why they couldn't help us, why they wouldn't help us. Um, so we tried different avenues to resolve that particular problem. We worked with our department, tried to get um, building blocks through the legislative process to get funding for storage and sometimes they would hear us and sometimes not. Um, at one point we did convince the legislature to let us at least study the issue and they gave us 100000 to do that. That was around 2006, 2007. Unfortunately, right when the report was due to be delivered to the legislature was when the recession hit. So any momentum that we would have had from that report, um, we couldn't follow through with. So then we were stuck yet again. So because we had no funding and yet we had this mandate, we had to go through alternative um, ways to store the data, mostly offline because the online had the ongoing costs. And so we chose some more risky options. We turned to a product called MDisk, which is a DVD, and then also portable hard drives. And we've been using those for many, many years just to be able to store data. Of course, the hard drives have problems where they um, they tend to fail pretty regularly and people would be trying to share data with each other within the office by um, unplugging the hard drive from their PC, carrying it upstairs to somebody else's office, letting them plug it in, and that's how we would share data, which was not very efficient. Um, the M-Discs have proven to be 
stable and they're very inexpensive, which is a plus, but of course the media obsolescence is still a risk. So we were fortunate in 2013 to have a law passed called the Open Records um, or Transparency Law, which provided a way for us to produce a website called the Open Records Portal, and with it came funding, which included funding for data storage. Yay, finally they, they paid for us. Um, so with that, we were able to purchase some time from DTS to work with a project manager. Um, this project manager um, created some documentation, a scope of work, just to work with the project manager. And we figured it would be about 50 hours of his time, which would come to around 3,700. We ended up um, spending most of that. Uh, the, the end of bill was a little bit less than the 3,700. But the project manager seemed to be the key with DTS to inform the organization as a whole as to what archives needs were. So he provided a formal agreement of what was to be accomplished, and then we had an evaluation at the end. And then happily, DTS understood finally what it was that we needed. So we met with the project manager pretty much on a weekly basis for several weeks, starting in December 2014 through March 2015. And at first, we explained what our business requirements were as we understood them. And then each successive meeting, more people would sort of be added to the, the meeting, and more people from archives, and then eventually more people from DTS who had different subject specialties. So the, the business manager came out with a statement um, that he wrote in his initial document saying, data storage is an integral part of the mission of the Utah State Archives. Moreover, there are special requirements for access, redundancy, and other areas that apply to archival records which do not apply to other state data stores. Current storage is dated and has problems with reliability and usability. This project will define and document the storage needs for archives so that a new and more effective solution can be acquired. So as we went through the process of defining what it is that we needed, it, he wrote it in his document. And at the end of the project, he had a final document that he presented to us that we could sign off on. And also the other people in DTS who were added to the meeting, such as people who were over storage, um, added their bits to it in a separate document. And they quoted us actual prices as to how much DTS would charge us for various storage options. In the end, we determined that the storage that we needed to work with for our day-to-day -day tasks, not just related to preservation, but all the workflow that leads up to preservation, um, we, had, we needed a quarantine store, which is defined as some place to park the data for 30 days until the virus definitions have a chance to catch up to whatever was transferred to you. Um, a local processing store, which is where our archivists would process electronic records and prepare the apes so that they could be um, ingested into the preservation system. Then we would have a preservation data store, which is connected to our preservation system. The access copy store, which is where we would need to store copies that would be um, linked to our websites and also to our research room to have internal access even for things that are not uh, posted online. Then we needed space to be able to migrate the formats from one format to another as time goes on. And also there was a, a need for transitory digital images. This is where our micrographic section digitizes microfilm or similar workflows. And so we have a bunch of images, TIFF images, where they need to be um, stored somewhere until it goes to the next step in the workflow, um, such as posting them online through digital collection or ingesting them or whatever the next step may be. So we had a need for that. So what happened in the end was DTS suggested that we spend our storage money that we got from the Open Records Portal. And since they now understood that our needs required a local storage device, which the centralized IT policy sort of forbade, um, they decided that we were different, we're special, and that they were going to install a NAS device in our building that we could use 
um, for especially for local processing and for the transitory storage. And we're and then we put 10 terabytes in each bucket for that. And also this NAS device had a tape library that we could use for additional copies of the the apes that would be preserved. So we would ingest our records into the preservation system and that would be one copy. We'd probably export an additional copy of that ape and store it in some other geographic location. But having the tape library was the key to getting uh, storage media that archivists prefer to use for um, good quality storage, which is tape. We also set up a forensic workstation which allows us to run various forensics actions and helps us with the quarantine store, although we DTS recommended that we keep the local hard drives for quarantine for the first 30 days and then put the data into the forensic workstation where we could then work on the SIP more. One thing we did not purchase, but it was put into the plan and quoted, was um, a jukebox for the optical disc, of the, the DVDs that we use and continue to use for our SIPs so that the research room could have access copies um, just locally supported and not have to worry about posting all of those things online. And then migration space will be allocated in the preservation system as needed. So that's pretty much what our storage um, activity was all about with the, the IT business manager. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Okay, so we're going to come on to a Q&A session uh, very shortly. Um, so please do use the Q&A function on the uh, Cisco WebEx uh, to submit any questions you've got for our speakers today. Um, so just a quick summary then um, from me. Um, so you need to make intelligent storage choices and decisions. Um, you need to have that ability to actually select where you want to place different types of content and then and that then allows you to actually optimize those costs. Um, you've got to stay flexible. Um, and that helps you take advantage of changing technologies and that's really key. Um, you need to understand the terms um, and the cost to, e to actually exit and get your content out. Preservation with access um, is the key to add in um, and to ensuring that your long-term uh, records uh, have sustainability um, and that your overall archive or record collection is sustainable um, for the future. And this preservation in the cloud is uh, proven. Uh, it's already being used by um, around about a third of states, uh, US states, um, archives and societies. Um, so it's already in practice and it's already in play. And um, we discussed a couple of those earlier in today's session. Okay, so we're gonna just move on. But before we go on to uh, the Q&A, just a quick next steps. Um, so that uh, PDP session um, on the 10th of January, as Sarah said, um, is gonna be moved to later in the year. Uh, COSA's got what's on tap for COSA in 2017 coming up on the 26th of January and you can learn about that on the uh, State Archivist website. Um, the next um, PDP webinar session is actually coming up on the 24th of January um, and that's looking at protecting uh, digital information. And we've got some great guest speakers lined up for that, so please do join us um, on the 24th of January uh, 2017. All that information is available on the COSA website. Um, if you did want to have a look at Preservica as a digital preservation uh, software, uh, we do run regular live demos, so you can pop along to one of those, just visit our website. Um, the next one is actually this Thursday on the 15th. And you can head to resources section uh, to learn more about everything you've heard here today, see some uh, recordings of webinars demonstrating synchronization with catalog systems and really learn more about uh, digital preservation. Okay, so we're gonna turn now to the Q&A. So I'm just going to have a look and see if there's any questions that have come in. OK, 
Okay, guys, this is a, obviously a great opportunity while we've got everyone on the call uh, to ask any questions. Don't be shy. Um, I'm not missing any, am I, Sarah? I don't think I I'm not seeing any right now. There is one, maybe oh, we can good. see it, in the Q&A from David Carmichael. And he's asking Jim to elaborate on how their solution will address preservation or migration of the records they store in the cloud. Sure. Preservation and migration, did you say? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so the way Oracle's cloud situation is set, set up for us, um, at least for the – let's talk primarily about the surrogate records because that's the biggest storage expense. Uh, we are putting those up there because largely we've received hundreds of terabytes from Ancestry and FamilySearch, and so – they're sitting on hard drives, and we know that over time those are going to decay. Um, we are going to be moving those all up into the cloud, and um, Oracle automatically creates two copies, at least two copies. They've committed to two copies. There may be three copies in their storage facilities. Um, and then the migration component is going to, if we need to move those, before we move them up into the cloud, we're creating open access copies. Um, if necessary, for some storage things. But most of these, I think, are in TIFFs anyhow. Uh, so that's how we're doing that component. For other types of storage, like emails, uh, Excel spreadsheets, whatever, that we're getting from government agencies, they're going into a different part of the cloud, um, a more secure part of the cloud, and a little bit more active storage so that we can pull those down regularly. The surrogate, the dark cloud, the surrogate side, is really just being stored so that we don't have to ever pay to digitize all the stuff that Ancestry has already done for us and that it's sitting out there should we ever need it. So it's really just dark storage. Dark, We're just putting it there and holding it there. The other things, we will end up migrating through Axiom, um, converting over locally here, and then storing it up in the cloud. So we'll have an open format version, an access version, and the original version all stored up in the cloud with two copies. So I hope that answers your question, David. Okay, good stuff. Thank you. Um, any more questions from anyone? Got a little bit of time left, so we can field any final questions. Of course, if you uh, think of something once you've um, left today's session, um, feel free to, to send a note in either the, directly into me or into Sarah and the team at COSA, and we will happily field that question um, at a later date. Okay, well, I think if there's no final questions in that case, uh, I think we can wrap up uh, today's. Oh, actually, sorry, last minute question just come in from Matt. Uh, so, it's a question for Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, is Utah exploring cloud storage options? I don't know if we are formally doing that, but I'm sure we're constantly looking at what our storage options are. So. It's entirely possible that we could look to the cloud for a copy of our storage. It's just that we went through the process with DTS to come up with storage that they could provide for us, and so that's what we're using at the moment. Okay, great. And um, if I could just add in to Matt Veach, um, Indiana would be happy to store Kansas's records for a fee. <laughs> Very kind offer there, Jim. <laughs> okay, so we have got um, Elizabeth. You're very popular, so we have got another question. Um, two more questions for you. So one from Mary. Uh, since working out your agreement with IT, have there been any issues arising from lack of understanding? And do you have a designated IT person who understands the archives' needs with whom you work? Well, we've had a couple of meetings with DTS related to our preservation environment since then. So I think as a whole, they do understand better than they used to. Um, as far as a designated IT person, we have a department IT director who works with us more closely than um, people have in the past, I think. Um, but it's still the same DTS structure, so we just had to 
convinced them that they needed to pay attention to our particular needs, which they are now. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth. And one more question for you, this time from Laurie. Uh, since the project manager documented the six types of storage required, have the requirements been updated? No. We still have the six buckets of storage that um, we need. And we're, we've been using the local processing, the transitory storage, to the point where they are filled up now almost. And uh, we need to move that off into our preservation system, but we're waiting for policies to be finalized and other things before we can do that. So we're still um, we're still exploring the solution that we've received, I guess would be the best way to put it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth. Right, well, I think that is it for the questions. Um, so from me, Ben, I'd just like to say a very big thank you to all of our guest speakers who have joined us today. A big thank you to Elizabeth, Jim, and Veronica. Thank you to Becky for hosting and setting up this session. And I shall hand you back to Sarah for a closing word. Thank you very much. I'd like to join David in thanking everybody for showing up. Um, go out to the website and sign up for additional webinars if you haven't thus far. And uh, we will see you after the holidays. Hope everybody has a very happy holiday. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.